Hello, heathens, and welcome to Spinning the Wheel Podcast. I am your slightly overstimulated host, Megan Angus, and this week we are going to be discussing Lunasod season, uh, full moon, blue moon, Aquarius moon, lunar week 27. Let's get into it. If you are a fan of the podcast, I'm sure this will come as a surprise. We have a lot to talk about. (laughs) You know, (laughs) guess what? There's stuff happening, uh, you know, in astrology, in the world, in your molecular makeup. There's just stuff everywhere. And we're going to try to talk about uh, a portion of it and make it all make sense. So the first thing that I want to bring your attention to, bring your focus into is our witch's work that we are doing as we move through Lunasod season. And I also want to talk about the global themes that we see in the various holidays, holy days, festivals, and other types of um, spiritual observances in all of the different religions and philosophies and spiritual and cultural practices around the planet at this time of year. Um, So our witches work that we are doing here in Lunasod season is focusing on increasing, having discussions around, becoming aware of, and really mostly embodying power, maturation, leadership, and production. And, oh boy, yes, all of those words can have a lot of funky baggage added to them, or a lot of really cool progressive baggage (laughs) added to them. Still baggage. We're not getting away from that. But here in Lunasod season, as pagans, as witches, as heathens, as polytheists, we are stepping into our power we are acknowledging our power and that then calls up various processes that kind of force us or heavily encourage (laughs) as the case may be maturation um one of the things that i will say a lot about the types of experiences that we see our deities go through during lunasod season and our mythic heroes and heroines and figures and our great archetypes and our ancestors at this time of year i will often describe their adventures or their experiences as harrowing and character building (laughs) um the the gods the goddesses and um again the various archetypes and figures from myth and from the fabled past um really go through some incredible challenges and some make it out alive and some don't and some but i I was about to say some make it out whole but that's actually not accurate really all of the figures make it out of these harrowing or challenging experiences changed or altered in some way. And that is a really important theme for me in Lunasod season or Lamas season or Lunasa season, however you like to call it. Um, That not only are we being presented with power in terms of like, here, have some power, or hey, did you recognize you're powerful? So we're not only being challenged or presented with that element, but we're also being called to use it. And in the doing of that, we may end up um, the target of the harshness of reality, right? What happens when you take the lead? You're out in the front. (laughs) And so, you know, if stuff is coming at you, you're going to be the first person or one of the first people to see it coming to Um, have a chance to figure out how to deal with it, but you also might be the person or one of the front people that takes the brunt of whatever that harshness or um, imposition is that the universe is bringing to you. So Lunasod season is really asking us at the same time, hey, step into your power because B, um, it's about to get funky <laughs> and and we need some people who can like weather the storm and are willing to kind of get banged up a little bit. That banged up thing is really important and special to me um, in Lunasad's symbology that we don't make it out perfect. 
We don't make it out unscratched or unchanged is really the most important thing there to me. In Lunasad season, we're being asked to step into our power. And I know I keep saying that over and over again, but it's the preface to <laughs> we're being asked to step into our power because hard things are coming and hard things are here. And I've said this in previous podcasts, and I've said that this in the classes before, but it really bears repeating, especially at this point in the, the turning of the wheel. There are a lot of teachings in metaphysics and in New Age practice that really encourage the idea that if you just magic enough, if you just magic the right way, it'll all turn out. It'll all work in your favor. And I disagree with this for a, a variety of reasons. <laughs> One, side note, it completely ignores context, right? It completely ignores um, the world a person was born into, right? It's very that idea of, oh, you just have to get your resume correct and you'll get the job eventually, totally ignoring how many jobs and or how many resumes are immediately turned down or not pursued simply because the name at the top of the resume sounds black or sounds Asian or sounds Hispanic, right? Okay, so well, we're gonna get bogged down in all of that stuff because we know that we talk about it a lot on here. But this idea that we can just magic hard enough and, you know, we're going to surpass the hard times, or we're going to just skate through the hard times, or as I was saying, most importantly, this idea that we are going to be potentially faced with hard times, but only temporarily, and we'll be completely unscathed on the other side. Lunasad season, if there is one incredibly important lesson to this season, and there's more than one, but if there is one, it is that time and experience bends us. <laughs> Doesn't break us but it does bend us. <laughs> it does put a kink in things every now and then. It does give us a limp, right? <laughs> it does give us a, a weak eye or, or you know, hard, hard hearing in one side or a sore tooth. It does stuff to us. Time and life, especially right now, tries us and wears us out and uses us up. And that's actually totally normal. That's actually completely natural. I think it's an unnatural thing where metaphysics and new age work, philosophy, spiritual practice, whatever, is attempting to um, circumvent that portion of the, of the life process or the, or the life cycle. Hard things happen and that's normal. It's okay. <laughs> we don't want to be destroyed by that, but we will be changed by that. And to attempt to circumvent that process, to me, is unnatural. I have a lot of side-eye for belief systems and magical practices and spiritual whatnotery out there that says, no, 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 if you magic right, if you do the ritual right, if you say the spell correctly, if you pray hard enough, if you tithe, you know, whatever it is that the, you know, let's face it, it's a pyramid scheme, right? Whatever it is that the source is telling you, ultimately, they're telling you it's your fault. Ultimately, they're telling you the reason why there's hard times in your life is because you have done something wrong or you have come up short in some way. And I say, respectfully, fuck that. I don't think that's true. I think the world is just fucking hard sometimes. Full stop. And when we can accept that shit's just going to be hard sometimes, we can get over the why me. We can get past the how could I have circumvented this? How could I have kept this from happening? And we can move into the triage, <laughs> right? <laughs> the immediate response of, oh man, that was hard. Well, how do we make things okay in the moment? And then we can move into what power did I get from this? What maturity did I get from this? What wisdom did I get from this really tough experience? And absolutely in the spirit of the holiday and what can I do with this wisdom for my people, for my community, for my neighbors, for my family, for the world at large. And that of course is very much, you know, ultimately the direction that conversation is headed for us here under this big fat um, Aquarius 
full moon, the second one, the second full moon in Aquarius this year. So if the gods are telling us anything, right, they're like, please focus on this. <laughs> please pay attention. <laughs> we need you to do this work so much so that we're giving you a second chance. <laughs> so get to it. So I just wanted to kind of bring us into that moment of focus, where we are in the wheel, where we are in the process of working our Lunasa, Lunasad, Lamas magic. Um, again, when we're talking about our witch's work, it's power, maturation, leadership, and production. And the global themes, which we will see reflected in our holidays this week, um, authority, wisdom, fruition, and ancestor work. And for me, all of these things sit very clearly and easily together. They all make sense to me. Um, okay, so that was my little rant. <laughs> Let's move on because, you know, it'll be a two and a half hour podcast. Uh, okay. <laughs> all right, my friends, this week starts with a big, fat, super juicy, badonka donk of a full moon in Aquarius at 29 degrees. And bring, I'm going to say this. Uh, we talked a lot about full moons in Aquarius and full moons at this time of year last month. Go listen to um, the Lunar Week 23 episode because that is the week that we had our first full moon in Aquarius. And I talk about herbivores ovulating and, you know, other cool full moon things that happen across the planet with migratory patterns and mating rituals and all of that kind of cool stuff. We've got too much to talk about. I'm not going to talk about it again, but that stuff is happening and it's really cool. If you want to know more about it, go listen to that episode, Lunar Week 23. This full moon would normally be called the Buck Moon, but last month's full moon in Aquarius was definitely called the buck moon. So some of the other full moons, uh, full moon names that we have for full moons in August are the sturgeon moon, green corn moon, because of course corn is coming up, doing its thing right now. Wheat cut moon, absolutely in line with our symbolism. Blueberry moon, moon when all things ripen, the grain moon, the dog days moon, harvest moon, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, I should mention women's moon. And that's actually going to come into play this week. Um, lightning moon, dispute moon, interesting names, right? Um, a lot of these, well, these names come from literally all over the planet. They come from a bunch of different traditions, old and new. Um, in North America, a lot of the uh, traditional or the most popular full moon names that you will hear here in America, in the United States, come from uh, the Algonquin Native American tribes. Uh, they have some of the coolest names for full moons. They're really depictive, um, very cinemagraphic. <laughs> um, okay, so what are we doing with this moon? Well, we have a little bit of pressure behind us, right? I started out with a bit of a preamble there, didn't I? I was like, it's Lunasad season. You better get your shit together. Um, I'm going to probably just say that for every portion of the wheel, so ignore me. But, <laughs> but the big thing that we're doing with this Aquarius full moon is we are celebrating our friendships. That's what's up. Now, if you want to like sit around with people and talk about the nature of friendship, the nature of camaraderie, the nature of allyship and being an accomplice and, um, you know, what it is to, you know, be involved with mutual aid groups where everyone is helping everyone and have a very like intellectual approach to this idea of friendship and friendship energies cool have at it it is a fantastic moon for that if you want to just like go to the club and hang out with your pals your posse your homies please by all means go and do it or go drink in the park or go not drink in the park have some juice in the park you know at one in the morning um whatever if you want to just go live with your friends and be with them and enjoy their presence super great moon for that too we don't have to have it be you know fraught with intellectualism and like soul wrenching work all the time, <laughs> just some of the time, but not all the time. Um, 
for our lunar body here on our full moon in Aquarius, we are opening, adorning, stimulating the legs and the calves. And for our plant body work, we are harvesting, we are doing pest control, we are weeding, and if plowing is something that is appropriate for you, or you can just aerate the soil in the plants that you have, whether they're in pots or window boxes or whatever. That's all very appropriate. Side note, not a doctor. I know I'm talking about body stuff. Doctor of love. I say it every week. Not a, not a medical doctor. Please, if you are wanting to incorporate the rhythms of the moon in your physical body apparatus care program, talk with your trusted health advisor, please. Um, okay, so that's what's up with this full moon. It's super sexy. Go hang out with your friends. Get down at the club. I did, and I'm a better person for it. Um, goddess bless all gay clubs and bars ever. Uh, okay. What else is happening on this day, though? Because we're not just going to have a big fat full moon, the second one in the same sign, because that's pretty fucking fancy in of itself. Oh, but it's not fancy enough because it is still Leo season. It, it, is it? Uh, uh, uh. The sun enters Virgo on this day. Um, and so what does that mean? <laughs> well, the sun in our astrological charts and in magical practice uh, represents our center, the center of our solar system, obviously, but also our personal center, our sense of self. The sun can represent our essence um, our potential and our life's purpose. So anytime the sun is doing something in the sky, like entering a new sign, there's an inference in astrology that, um, that we are going to take on a little bit of that sign, no matter where it falls in our chart. The sun has moved into that sign. So we all are going to maybe wear the t-shirt of that sign a few more times this month than we normally would. And the sun is moving into Virgo. So what do we get with Virgo energy? Well, <laughs> I know all the Virgo placements out there are like, you better say nice stuff because... <laughs> because <laughs> everybody tears up on Virgos and it's true. And there's a reason. Okay. <laughs> I have Virgo placements. I'm saying all of this with love <clears throat> and knowledge. Okay. Okay. <laughs> when we're dealing with Virgo energy, Virgo energy can be practical and it can be petty. It can be efficient, but it can also be really nitpicky. Um, Virgo energy can get lost in the details it can be overly concerned with correction and refinement, but it is also extremely discriminating and precise. So Virgo energy can really bring us into a place where we start to notice the granular elements about stuff a little bit more than we usually would. And the sun moving into that is that we are identifying with that kind of thinking. We're identifying with that kind of process functioning. Um, and so let me read from the Wheel of the Year book. Uh, if you want a copy of this, please join my Patreon. Um, all patrons uh, can watch the videos for free. And all of the patrons that are subscribed at the Venus level, which is $9 and up, um, have access to the Wheel of the Year Dropbox folder. And that has the workbooks and the slides and lots of other extra information, like the calendars that I'm re referring to every week, um, all ready to go. Just download it. You'll get it with your patronage. Um, comes in your welcoming email. Okay. But this is from the book, some of it anyways. Um, when we move into Virgo season, our attention begins to turn to the little details in life. We start taking care of our bodies, we start taking care of our homes, and we start looking to tie up the loose ends of summer. When the sun moves into Virgo, that is our little alarm bell ringing off in the distance saying, there's only four more weeks of summer. Yeah, I know. I'll, I'm saying it. Sorry, it's the truth. I didn't make the rules. It's just the way it is. But that's our heralding call off in the distance as we're frolicking naked in the fields, blazing with, you know, glory and whatnotery. Um, 
you know, off in the distance, somebody's like, hey, <laughs> hey, <laughs> and we're like, la, 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 la. So this is Virgo desperately trying to get her attention. That's like, things are going to shift. And this is the time to start to prepare for that shift. Um, as we move into the final weeks of summer during Virgo season, we can feel a little overblown, a little spent, a little hungover, perhaps, from the excess of summer. And you know what? That's good. That's what summer's for. We should be blowing it out right now. And that's part of why Virgo becomes sort of this hermitage moment is like, whoo, I went a little hard. <laughs> I went a little ten intense there. So I'm going to just pull back two steps, take some deep breaths, drink another glass of water, get my feet under me, <laughs> get, get my act together here. Um, a hermitage is just exactly what the situation needs. Getting back to the personal, the daily routine, the simple self-care elements, the personal rituals of life. Also, it's hard to believe that this magical time of summer will end, but the elder in us knows the wheel turns and summer will end. Begin tending to the body now, recalling the self work like routine that is so needed in fall and winter. Work with and thank your community healers and people who hold space for us to have these hermetic moments. Really, really important stuff. So sun moving into Virgo. Yes, our attention is going to be brought a little bit more into the small details, the daily rhythms, our body care routines. And it really is just a like, okay, I went hard in Leo season. Let me pull back two steps and get my act together, refresh, get my laundry done. You know what's up. <laughs> Nobody's getting laundry done, but let's just pretend. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. But is that everything that's happening on this day? No, because we also have the heliacal rising of the fixed star Regulus. Let's get into it. The fixed star Regulus um, is in the constellation of Leo, technically, um, but it is also rising as the same day that the sun is moving into Virgo. So clearly there's some overlap. You have to go and read for yourself about sidereal astrology and fixed stars. Just trust me, I'm right. Uh, <laughs> the traditional name Regulus is Latin for prince or little king. In Arabic, it is called Al-Assad, the heart of the lion. Um, in Latin, it is Cor Leonis, and in Greek, it's Cardia Leontos. And all of these mean the heart of the lion, the center of the lion, the chest of the lion. In Chinese, uh, this is represented by the mytho figure, the Yellow Emperor. We don't have time in this podcast to talk about the Yellow Emperor. What an amazing figure. What an amazing auspicious entity and deity from Chinese belief and myth. Incredible stuff. Um, so this star is connected to that character as well. Big deal. <laughs> Center of the universe kind of big deal. Um, in Babylon, this was Sharu, the king, and Lugal, the star that stands in the breast of the lion, the king. In Persia, this was Mian, or the center, and Venant, one of the four royal stars of the Persian monarchy. Um, uh, and also in Persia, I should say, uh, in approximately 3000 BC, it was known as the Watcher of the North, and it marked the summer solstice. That speaks to our precession of the equinoxes, or the zodiacal precession that we work with as a meta topic here in the Wheel of the Year work. Um, symbolically, uh, this is the crushing foot. Regulus is associated with the healing archangel Raphael, who is, of course, one of the four archangels that's used in or worked with in lots of different magical systems, as well as by Catholics and a few other groups, um, but also associated with being one of the four horsemen. So, you know, that's exciting. Um, okay, that's all I want to say about Regulus. It's an indicator of... Um, 
regality of royalty, sovereignty, um, and the fact that it is uh, rising on the same day that in tropical astrology, the sun is moving into Virgo is a big deal because um, this star has been affiliated with or associated with the ideas of kingship, as in penis centric, <laughs> masculine centric, um, patra centric power for a very long time. And I mean, like a long time. And now the fixed star is moving into the constellation of Virgo, the grain maiden, the, the queen. This is not, the Virgo is a very not masculine archetype. Virgo is a very feminine, matra oriented, gyne oriented uh, archetype. And, you know, we've talked about this in the classes, we've, we've talked about this in the podcast. Um, a lot of our Western European paganism and hermeticism, obviously, uh, you know, going back to the Greco Egyptian forms of it, um, is very bi oriented, dual oriented, it's very black, white, man, woman, up, down, yes, no. And we know that there are lots and lots of other spiritual practices and and magical paradigms out there to work with. It's just important to understand the symbolism uh, in its context. Okay. So Leo has a lot of masculine stuff attributed to it. It doesn't have to, it just does. Um, and I shouldn't say it just does as if that just happened. It's by humans. Humans did that. <laughs> um, but we've seen strong Leonine goddesses too. So it doesn't have to be a masculine thing. It can be feminine or non-gendered or whatever. Virgo is very gyne oriented because this is a goddess that gives birth. This is a character, an entity, a deity, an archetype that is mothering stuff and bringing it into the world. And we've talked about this too. Anybody can be a mother. Any person of any gender can be a mother. Um, because being a mother doesn't specifically mean to a flesh baby. It can mean I'm just bringing stuff into the universe and helping to produce things. So the sun has moved into Virgo. So we are all identifying with this. I'm producing stuff. I'm here to discern and refine and produce. Um, and this fixed star speaks to a level of um, regalness about this character, royalty. Something is special about the power and the responsibility that they wield or that they carry. So um, let's now move on to some of the holy days that we are working with this week. And I think that this symbolism around Virgo is going to become more and more obvious. Half hour into the podcast, and we haven't even gotten to the first holiday on the first day. We are right on track. Okay, let's go. Uh, <laughs> our holy days for August 22nd. Um, as in the last few weeks, I'm going to edit uh, what we are all going to talk about. So there's a few things that I'm not going to mention, a few things I'm going to briefly mention, and then a few things I'm going to focus on more intensely. If you have any questions about anything from the calendar, send me an email. Um, let's talk about it. Okay, so from our Hindu friends, we have Raksha Bandhan. This is a really cool yearly festival that happens between sisters and brothers. Um, they make gifts for each other, and it's very much this, like, I love my sister, I love my brother, sibling love, sibling, you know, friendship and companionship kind of uh, festival. It's really cool. Um, also from our Hindu friends, we have Tendong Loram Fat. Uh, this is also celebrated throughout uh, East Asia, Southeast Asia. This is a monsoon and rain worship festival uh, where the monsoons and the rains are literally being worshipped. We have the monsoon season happening throughout India and Southeast Asia at this time of year. It kicks off in July and it runs for about four months. Um, and this very much can be seen as the water breaking before the great massive harvest of fall equinox that happens. Kind of cool, huh? Okay. Also happening 
at this time, on this day, my old eyes, I have to make my font larger, sorry. I guess I could have edited that out, but you know, we're cool like that, right? Okay. We have from our Taoist friends, the Hungry Ghost Festival. Um, in this festival, the realms of heaven and hell and the realm of the living are all open. Uh, this is, uh, and, and ancestors and the dead alike, uh, I guess I should say, um, ancestors from people's personal families, as well as anybody else that they knew who have died, um, you know, uh, pop figures or their friend down the street, you know, anything like that. This is a day, um, where people lay out food offerings, they burn incense, they burn joss paper, they do paper mache forms of material items like clothes or money or food and that kind of stuff. And it's all for these visiting spirits and people, it's basically a way of kind of like appeasing the spirits and sending them back to the worlds of the dead, hopefully a little more pacified, a little more peaceful, um, like fed and, um, and loved up and, you know, shown, shown some love basically. <laughs> um, and this is different from the King Ming festival that we talked about earlier in the year, because that is very much about ancestor worship specifically. And in the hungry ghost festival, it's very much like whoever the heck has died. Are you hungry? Come and hang out at the table. Do you need a new shirt? Bob's got new shirts over there. You know, <laughs> we've got you hooked up. Don't worry about it. Um, but yeah, elaborate meals um, and lots of incense and a lot of that other cool stuff. Other festivities might include like buying and releasing miniature paper boats and lanterns on the water. And this signifies giving direction to the lost ghosts and spirits of the ancestors and other deities. Um, if I am remembering my notes for this episode, that is the only holiday that we have this week that is a very overt um, reference to our death and ancestor work that we are doing throughout Lunasod season. But we have one near, we have one or more basically every week throughout the season of some sort of acknowledgement of the dead. To me, it sits very nicely with the meteor showers that we are having at this time of year. That's a common thing that you see, um, but not not exclusive uh, okay the other holy day that i want to talk about for this day um and this is probably in a way the most important holy day that i want to talk about on this day is the queenship of mary from our catholic friends now i know somebody out there is like oh are they putting catholicism in my pagan podcast yeah just a little bit it'll be fine uh, <laughs> why? Because the Catholics have done an incredible job at documenting paganism. That's why. <laughs> uh, because they stole a lot of it and they just kind of kept it how they found it and moved on. Um, so on this day, we witness or the Catholic Church witnesses the queenship of Mary. Now, interesting thing about this holiday is that it was uh, officially added to the roster in like 1954, 1955. So in a sense, it's a very modern holiday. But the idea of the queenship of Mary is something that goes back to the oldest scriptures. And really what this was, was the Catholic Church finally, openly, obviously in documentation admitting, yes, Mary is actually holy. She is a deity in and of herself. Up to that point, there was sort of this like, yeah, you can pray to her, but she's just a lady. She's just a human. She just did something really fancy or something fancy was done to her. You know, she just was there while fancy things happened was very much the attitude of the Catholic Church. But they also at the same time knew all these civilizations that were conquering, a lot of them worship a goddess or several goddesses, as a matter of fact. We better keep the Virgin Mary in the package because people are going to flip out if they don't have a goddess deity to relate to in some way. And so here, finally, in the 1900s, the Catholic Church was like, okay, why did they do it? I don't know. There was a lot of weird Christian stuff happening in the 1950s. There was a whole big push to like Jesusify America even more than it was already. Um, so maybe it was that. I don't know. But um, but to me, very interesting timing because hello, the day the, the sun moves into the day the sun moves into Virgo, right? 
Yes? Okay. Just checking. Day moves on Sun, Virgo. It's the star. Regulus is now in alignment with that. And now the Catholic Church wants to also say, oh, yeah, Mary is uh, actually a deity. Mary is actually holy in her own right. So in this festival, in this holy day, this moment, the Catholic Church and Catholic practitioners acknowledge Mary as a divine entity, a holy being, um, a part of the holy orgy that is the the god <laughs> that's catholics worship there's so many parts there's so many parts so i love this that we have this day kicking off virgo season um and in alignment with everything else that's happening in the week it's really really cool stuff okay let's move on to the rest of the week all right august 23rd we have a disseminating moon in pisces now, all of our moons uh, in Pisces, no matter what phase it's in, bring us into a place that's very touchy-feely, very sensitive, very charitable, very connected with other people and their emotional states, sometimes too connected. Um, and one of the things I like to say about Pisces moons is when the moon is waxing, we're dealing with one fish. And when the moon is waning, we are dealing with the other fish. Um, <laughs> so on the waxing... Um, you know, we are working with increasing our sensitivity and becoming more aware and more connected to the people around us. But on the waning of the Pisces moons, that can get into some funky places that can get into some funky work. So this is really important because um, Virgo is the sign opposing Pisces. And yet both of these signs, when they're pressed, when they're stressed, um, can approach problems in the same way, which is I'll just destroy myself to fix whatever needs to have happen here. In vice in, in Virgo, we will work ourselves to death. We will we will scrub the toilets um, even though it's not our job to do so. We will sweep the floor because nobody else is going to do it. Um, we will we will go above and beyond, oftentimes in a very thankless manner to make sure that the thing gets done. And in Pisces, we're willing to do that with like our sense of self or our soul. It's like, I'm willing to give you the shirt off of my back. I'm willing to um, give you my last dollar out of my bank account um, because what am I in the face of the suffering of the world? And who you are is a person with a life that still has like people and situations that are relying on you, right? So in this disseminating Pisces moon, um, we can, we are stepping into a conversation where we are talking with ourselves ar about giving around charitable actions, um, and the baggage that comes along with that stuff and specifically giving to the point of martyrdom and how that actually doesn't serve anyone. <laughs> Pisces is like, yes, absolutely. Let me obliterate myself in this task. Um, but if we take two steps back from that, it's like, okay, well, what happens the next day? Um, it, it's it's a very snarky thing that I like to say, but I do like to say this. Um, you know, it's very convenient that you have your hands nailed down because now you don't have to do the dishes. And it's that thing that's kind of coming up here is like, where do we sort of, you know, lose ourselves in the act of helping others? Um, you know, are we helping people so that we feel needed? Are we helping people to be able to cast ourselves as the good guy in our own like mental TV show? Um, are we helping others so that we can feel superior? Are we helping others so that we can feel pride about our sacrifice that we made? Um, and so this moon is a really fantastic converse moment to just kind of like pull off to the side of the road and have a little convo with yourself before going forward in our big context of being a leader, stepping into our maturity, stepping into our responsibility. Is there a way that I can give selflessly, but also cleanly? with no special emotional attachments. Is that possible for me to do? Given that we've got um, Venus in the sign of 
Virgo, I think, still. Uh, the sun has just entered Virgo. We have this fixed star that's at the very first point of Virgo. It's a lot of Virgo energy. And this disseminating moon in Pisces is like, yes, totally. Let's obliterate ourselves in the service to the thing. And I'm like, no, <laughs> don't do that. Uh, because we've got tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. <laughs> I'm going to need you to do stuff later. Do not destroy yourself on this task now. <laughs> All right. When we are working with the disseminating moon in Pisces, we, uh, for our lunar body, we are reducing, relaxing, soothing, and resting our feet and our ankles in particular. So if you've had, if you have a special foot scrub or foot soak that you've been saving, now is the time to use it. <laughs> uh, and for our plant body work, we are planting, transplanting, or grafting um, any plants where we want to support and encourage below ground growth. That's what's up. Okay. Also happening on this day, we have Venus in Libra, trine Saturn retrograde in Aquarius at eight degrees. This is a very non-flamboyant transit. Venus is very like, oh my God, I'm wearing all tan. What is happening? Um, <laughs> so we're a little conservative on this day, but this is actually very nice. Uh, the, the sun moving into Virgo is like, yes, I'm all about this. I'm very into this, you know, sensible attitude <laughs> here. So we can find ourselves being conservative with money um, and uh, being comfortable with that. Um, uh, this is a day that is really fantastic for sensible business decisions. We will seek out and function well within relationships that are reliable or stable. Um, and also, we may find ourselves seeing our relationships in a much more realistic light. So if you have been having some problems in a friendship or a love partnership or a domestic partnership or whatever, romantic partnership, this might be a day where you don't just see the situation more realistically, you see the other person across from you more realistically. And that, to me, is the most beautiful type of empathy that we can possibly have. So that really sits in a, in a lovely way in, in my mind with the sun st stepping into Virgo, with this disseminating Pisces moon that wants to encourage us, you know, to move into martyrdom, this um, Venus Saturn transit is like, hey, let's just be realistic about stuff. Let's just see each other for who we actually are. Let's just see the situation for what it actually is. Um, it is a fantastic time to discuss problems in relationships as well. Um, there will be times this week where I don't encourage that. Uh, Monday the 23rd, I do. All right, let's talk about our fixed stars and our holy days for August 23rd. Um, we have the heliacal rising of the fixed star Fecta or Alfecta. Um, this is in the, this means the thigh of the bear. Um, I don't have any myths this week in particular that connect back to bears, but Virgo uh, is connected to bear energy. We do see that in some myths. Um, okay. Other things that are happening on this day, we have the Basile from our Mycenaean ancestors. There is very little info about this holiday. The word Basile uh, said a bunch of different ways. I don't have the, the thing in front of me, sorry. Um, it can mean king, but it really just means sovereign. So it can mean queen as well. So there's something about this day that had something to do with kingship, queenship, sovereignty of some kind going all the way back to Mycenaean times. Also on this day, we have Korotrophos from our Greek ancestors. Now the word Korotrophos uh, is the name of a goddess or a deity that was um, literally the spirit of child rearing. Um, but this is also a name that was given to any uh, Greek gods and goddesses who oversaw 
uh, protection of young people or the protection of children. So on the calendar, the the festival Korotrofos uh, refers to a, a small feast day f- held specifically for Hecate and Artemis, who both protect women and children and protect people that are in the, the act of childbirth. We already know that Virgo is this grand goddess deity archetype that's going to give massive mega birth to this massive harvest across the Northern Hemisphere, starting all the way back in June or July, right? And running all the way through October. And so now we see a holiday here that's dedicated to two of the goddesses that are assisting in that process. Okay, moving on to August 24th. All right, on August 24th, the moon has moved into Aries. So now we are working with the disseminating moon in Aries. And this moon is a fantastic remedy to the martyrdom of the Pisces moon. So on this moon, we are encouraged to team up with others to fight for mutual goals. Um, We might not be in alignment with these folks in any other way, but they agree with the goal. And that is the important thing. So learning how to take the lead and drive, learning how to be special and stand out, and how to detach that from our ego. That's all the stuff that we're doing in Lunasod season. Hey, kind of cool that we've got this lunar phase to assist us with that work. How do we be special? How do we take the lead? How do we drive? How do we cherish our power and our skills but we don't ha- let our ego become attached to that. It's about the team and it's about the goal, not getting credit for our special part, but absolutely taking pride in our part. Get the difference there? Okay. For our lunar body work that we are doing while the moon is in Aries, the disseminating moon is in Aries, we are reducing, relieving, soothing, resting, restoring, and relaxing the scalp, the face, the hair, sinuses, anything with the head, the whole head. That's all ruled by Aries. Um, All super appropriate. And then for our plant body work, we are harvesting, we are controlling pests, we are weeding, we are plowing, and we are pruning. Um, And as we've talked about quite a bit, Letha season and Lunasod season, both especially Letha, but also absolutely Lunasod season, super, super powerful time to harvest plants for magical work throughout the rest of the year. Um, And obviously, Lunasod season, first harvest, so we're doing some harvesting here. Okay, let's look at our holy days for August 24th. We actually have a fair amount of holy days for August 24th. We're not going to get too deep into all of them, but briefly. From August 24th to 27th is the Eleusinia, and this is not the great... Eleusinian Mysteries, even though the name is very similar. This is a Thanksgiving festival held to honor Demeter for the gift of grain, but it wasn't held every year. Uh, When it took place, it was either as a major festival called the Great Eleusinia, held during the fourth year of the Olympiad, or it was a minor festival held during the second year. Processions, games, sacrifices, all the regular stuff. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, Also happening on this day, we have the Feast of Mania and the Manes from our Etruscan ancestors. Mania was a goddess of the dead. So here, whoops, I I was wrong. I I forgot my notes. Um, So here we do have another holiday recognizing death work in this week. Um, She ruled the underworld. She was said to be the mother of ghosts, the undead, and other spirits of the night, as well as the lairs and the mains. The lairs are like household ancestor deities that people keep in their house on purpose. Um, Her name links her to the mains, Mania Janita and Manius. And what's really important here uh, is that Mania derives from the Indo, uh, the Proto-Indo-European word or word part men men to think um and it cognates to the ancient greek minos which is mind and thought and um the manu which means spirit and so in roman and attrition mythology mania is the goddess of spirits and chaos 
in Greek mythology, she is the goddess of insanity and madness. And I think that's very interesting because Virgo is ruled by the deity or the planet Mercury. And Mercury absolutely oversees the mind, the intellect, how we think, what we think, how we take in information, where we get information from, all that stuff. So that was a very interesting link for me. Okay. Uh, also on this day, we have the Feast of St. Bartholomew. Uh, this was a homie who was beheaded. And so he is depicted with a knife and his flayed skin. Oh, he was flayed and beheaded both, I think. Um, and they made him a patron saint of leather makers and tanners. And I was like, that is, that is, that's some morbid shit, you guys. All right. All right. Also on this day, we have two festivals. Uh, well, we have a bunch of different festivals, right? But we have these two festivals. One is called Portunalia and the other one is Tiberinalia. They are both from our Roman ancestors. Um, Portunalia is a festival, was a festival dedicated to the deity Portunus, who is related to Janus, who also has a holiday on this day. There's a Dies Natalis for the Temple of Janus on the same day. Um, this was an ancient Roman god of keys, doors, livestock, and ports. He may have originally protected warehouses where grain was stored, but later became associated with ports because of the folk associations between gates and doors, porta, and harbors, portus, the gateway to the sea. Um, also, here we see uh, the Roman festival for Tibinalia, um, Tiberinalia, excuse me. And uh, this is to the god, uh, the father Tiber of the river Tiber, um, known as the river god who found the twins, Romulus and Remus, and gave them to the she-wolf Lupa, who had just lost her own cubs to suckle. Uh, he later rescued and married Rhea Silvia, the mother of the twins and a Vestal Virgin. Um, all happening on this day. All right. Let us move on to August 25th. Oh, yeah, as I'm, mention as I'm saying that. Vestal Virgin. Another name, of course, for Virgo is the Virgin. Queenship of the Virgin Mary. You know, I'm sure it's just a coincidence, as we like to say here on the channel. Moving on to August 25th. All right, August 25th, we still have our disseminating moon in Aries, and it is exact... Uh, exactly disseminating, I should say, at 18 degrees of Aries at approximately 1026 p.m. Pacific Standard Time and later for everyone else around the planet. Uh, August 25th is a Wednesday and wouldn't you know it, wouldn't you know it, it's also the day that Odin receives his knowledge in Norse uh, popular pop modern uh, Norse mythology and folk practice. Um, this is the uh, uh, acknowledging or celebra celebrating, celebrating, uh, acknowledging <laughs> the nine days that Odin hung on uh, the tree Yggdrasil. He loses an eye in the process and he gains his wisdom. Odin is Woden and the day Wednesday is absolutely named after this deity. So it's kind of cool that on Wednesday we have Woden's day. <laughs> Pretty dope. Now, remember all of that stuff that I was talking about mania and the mains just a moment ago? Well, here's this. Uh, if we look at the etymology of Odin's name, it is connected to a bunch of words across Central and Northern Europe that mean possessed, mad, frantic, furious, insane, frenzied, wild, crazy, uh, mind, wit, sense, song and poetry, uh, sound, noise, voice or song, thrill, violent agitation, rage or frenzy, uh, madness or fury. So Woden is absolutely known, Woden, Odin, Wotan, is absolutely known, past and present, as this character who is very much a sage, very much a sorcerer, a magician, very hermetic, very similar to the character Mercury, the, the god Mercury. Um, but was also known to be a little loopy, <laughs> a.k.a., um, you know, entered shamanic ecstatic states. Um, and perhaps this is something that we could use to inform ourselves on 
uh, how it is exactly that Greeks were working with a deity and an idea idea like mania um was it simply that this was just oh we're crazy you know and there's nothing wrong with being crazy unless you hate it and then you know <laughs> sorry um go, go work with a therapist um and go to work with a doctor and get yourself healthy it's okay um no judgment here um but also that perhaps there is room uh, in our interpretation of these things for not just fear, not just negativity, not just looking down on these states as if they are something bad to be avoided, but also in a like, yes, sometimes as we go through these processes, we are pushed to extremes in our thought. We're pushed to extremes in our um, the ways that we're expressing our inner experience. And we may sound, quote unquote, crazy to somebody who is listening to us. Um, all of that stuff. I don't know. I just think it's very cool that all of this is happening at the same time. I guess that's kind of the whole point of these podcasts, isn't it? <laughs> uh, all right. Let us move on to August 26th. All right. On August 26th, we have a variety of things going on. What I want to talk about, though, is Mercury in Virgo, Trine Pluto in retrograde in Capricorn, uh, at 24 degrees. Um, this is a day that really encourages a deep dive into some stuff. Now we're working with the energy of Virgo and Capricorn. These are both earth signs. Virgo speaks, speaks more to our, our body care, the care of our immediate environment, our daily routines, that kind of stuff. And Capricorn absolutely thinks about the long term of all of that. If um, Virgo speaks to our day to day work environment, Capricorn speaks to our career, the, the ultimate trajectory of that stuff. So there's a connection here between something that's a little bit more immediate and something that's a little bit more long term or far reaching. And in this, specifically with Mercury being, you know, the one that wants to know stuff, the one that wants to go gather information, and Pluto being the, pl the planet that really is concerned with the depth of things, secrets, but like ultimate secrets, <laughs> like the deep down stuff. Um, this is a fantastic day um, for giving some really deep issues the attention that they deserve. Uh, this is a day that I encourage digging to find out. Um, we might be faced with some mysteries on this day. There might be some detective work that is required. Also, some secrets may come to the surface that's like, oh, I've been waiting for this piece of the puzzle. Oh my gosh, things are really starting to make sense. Things are like locking together now. I get this. I, I understand this. Um, it's a great day to look for lost things. Um, it's a really great day to take a deep look inside. So it's a really great day for therapy too. I am not a therapist. I'm just a witch, <laughs> but this is a really great day to talk to somebody in a therapeutic environment because you and they are more inclined to get to the, the deep, the bottom of the thing. Um, this might be a day that you work better alone. Um, because you're just like in your feelings, you're in your thoughts, you're deep down in there and you're working through the stuff. Um, heavy stuff may come up, but also, and potent ideas may come up. So again, from the deep, right? The only thing I would say to watch out for with this transit is watch for obsession. And I know that that's a, a potent word to work with, but Pluto can really lead us into getting obsessive and compulsive about things. Um, so anytime we have any planet aspecting Pluto, it'll wake up a little bit of that stuff. It's a trine, so it's not agitating it too much. Um, but yeah, if there's anything to watch out for on that day, that would be that. Okay. Now, um, I think I said this already, but let me say it again. We still have our disseminating moon in Aries. That's still happening in the sky. So now, briefly, let us look at the holy days of August 26th. So from our Finland friends, we have the Feast of Ilmatar or Luonatar. Uh, this is a goddess um, that is depicted as the spirit of nature um, and the mother of the sea. 
and is also connected to spirits of air as well, which of course is a very Mercury Virgo kind of thing. Um, I know I just said Virgo is an earth sign, but Virgo is ruled by Mercury, which is an air planet. Also on this day, we have the anniversary of um, the commemoration of the 1920 adoption of the 19th Amendment, which gave women, some women, the right to vote. So this is Women's Equality Day here in the United States. Of course, this was not really recognized um, until the 1970s. And of course, we all know that, you know, women had the right to vote, sure, if they were white, middle class, if their husbands allowed it, if their priests allowed it, if their dad thought it was okay, then yes, maybe if the other girls thought it was cute and we were all going to get dressed up, maybe they would go and vote. So, you know, meh, okay. Also on this day, we have the Feast of the Heroines from our Greek ancestors. This is a festival. We do have these from time to time. Um, we talk about it in classes and the podcast. This is a festival that we have documented, but we don't have a re the name of it is documented, but we don't have any details about it. We don't know what's up. But again, interesting now that we're in Virgo season and we have all of this Virgo energy rolling through Feast of the Heroines. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. And also from our Roman ancestors, we have the Vanalia Rustica for Venus. Um, this was a rustic Latin harvest festival celebrating the grape harvest, vegetable, vegetable growth, and fertility. Um, and at the Roman Vanalia Rustica, kitchen gardens and market gardens and vineyards were all dedicated to Venus obsequens, which was the oldest known form of Venus. I know we've, we've talked a lot of in the other, uh, in previous podcasts about how all of these Greek and Roman deities had all of these different epithets added to their names um, based on their location and various things that people ascribed to them, duties and powers and things like that. So this is Vin Venus Obsequens, um, who is basically like Venus the provider, Venus the producer, Venus the, the one from whom the grain pours out is basically what we're saying. Um, it's funny because Roman opinions differ on which deity presided over this. Um, there are some sources that insist uh, that this holiday was sacred to Jupiter um, because he controlled the weather and he governed growing and ripening of grapes. And like Jupiter's priests would come in and pick the first bunch of grapes and bless the first sacred pressings and offer sacrifice and all this stuff. But um, in practice, the festival had very strong popular and cult connections to Venus as the patron goddess of ordinary religiously impure wine, quote unquote, AKA the wine that normal folks were going to drink. Uh, some of the rites took place at her various temples. Um, the sacrificial victim offered by Jupiter's priests, a female lamb may actually be evidence. Um, if not of Venus herself, then of an ancient rustic Latin goddess, very much like her. So again, Venus, Virgo energies, all running through all of this stuff. Okay, let's move on to August 27th. Okay, August 27th, the moon has moved into Taurus. And so now we have our disseminating moon in Taurus. And my advice for this moon is really simple. Pick up some tools and help out. Um, we are in Lunasad season. We've already talked about that. That is about stepping into your power, your maturity, your responsibility, um, and the processes and the situations that are going to kind of force that situation. <laughs> um, and we have had this Pisces moon that's like, oh, why do I help people? What's that all about? And we've had our Aries moon that's like, ah, <laughs> quit it. Just help. <laughs> Just team up with people who are trying to get stuff done and go get some stuff done. And now here we have our Taurus moon that's like, okay, so let's really actually get some stuff done. Um, if you have some things to do around your house, get it done. Uh, move the couch, hang that painting, whatever it is. Um, but maybe you have a friend or a neighbor or, you know, somebody in your building that needs some help with something like that. Maybe you have a friend or a neighbor that needs help moving their couch or getting this particular job done. Jump in and help them out. Um, 
And if you can't find if something in your own house or something in your own community, then check in with a group like Habitat for Humanity or someone along those lines. Maybe people that are um, growing and tending pea patches that are food that is going to be given out to homeless folks. Um, but this Taurus moon really encourages you to like get your hands on some tools and make some physical changes and improvements to the physical world. That's really, really what's up with the disseminating moon in Taurus. For our lunar body, we are resting, relaxing, restoring um, all of the speech and hearing centers. So our teeth, our mouth, our tongue, our ears, our jaw, our neck, and even down into the tecolotage, like the tops of the shoulders. The shoulder shoulders are really about Gemini, but where the neck connects to the shoulders, that whole area of the body, rest, restore, rejuvenate, relax, soothe, all of that. And for our plant body work, we want to be planting, transplanting, or grafting for below ground plant support and growth. Okay, August 27th, we have one big old festival from our Greek ancestors, which is the Hera Telkinia. Um, and the Telkinia is another epithet added to Hera's name. Um, not entirely certain where it came from. Possibly from the Telkis, who were inhabitants on the island of Crete. Um... And these people were considered the first metal workers and later as sorcerers. And that I wanted to include because of our information about Wednesday and Woden and him being a sorcerer, the other Virgo hermetic stuff that we're talking about this week, sorcery and hermits and all of that stuff. So just thought that was really cool. Okay, let's move on to August 28th. Okay, August 28th, we still have our disseminating moon in Taurus. And the only astrology that we have for this day is the sun in Virgo square the North node in Gemini at six degrees. Um, and I wanted to mention this because even though it is a square, this could actually be a really helpful moment that might not feel like it at first. This transit points out where in a situation that is otherwise going fine, where some cracks might appear in the future when the situation is under more stress. This transit is about kind of having a conversation with yourself on the subject of complacency, evolution, and deciding between resting on your laurels or just making the best of a situation versus facing the deficiencies that are in a situation and addressing things that you know will eventually become a problem. So do you see how that, like, on the surface, that doesn't feel like exciting, fun work, but actually this is a really big help moment? It's the universe being like, hey, I know everything looks fine on the surface, but using our Virgo discernment, if we dig in here and start to look at the details, we absolutely are finding some cracks in the foundation. There's there's some flaws here. There's some mistakes. There's some pieces missing. There's some stuff that's not working right anymore. There's parts that are worn out, whatever it is. Um, and so this is a really fantastic day where the universe is like, hey, before it's really serious, I'm going to show you in a small way that this thing is maybe not going to work out the way that you're hoping it will in the future. And now you have time to deal with that. Change it, grow it, fix it, burn it off, whatever needs to happen. Okay. <laughs> um, looking at our uh, holy days that we have for August 28th, we have two from our modern Norse uh, and Asatru folk we have uh, the date of Freyfaxi or Freya's Blot or Holfmas, Holffest. Um, these all mean uh, Lunasad, Loaf Fest, Lamas, that stuff. Uh, we talked about this a lot in um, the actual class. So go back and watch the video if you want to know more about it. Um, but this is the fixed date on modern uh, Norse calendars um, for folks that worship the Norse deities. 
this is the fixed date that they celebrate this. Um, there is no specific correct date for this harvest festival. Uh, some groups celebrate it at the beginning of the month to coincide specifically with Lamas on the 1st of August. Some of them will do it right in the middle of the month and some of them do it on the full moon. And so that's what this happens to be aligned with, even though this is a fixed date. It's the week of the full moon. Pretty cool. Okay. Also on this day, we have from our Roman ancestors, Consuela. And this is our first Consuela here. Um, and then the next one is going to be in December. And this is in honor of the deity Consus, a tutelary deity of the harvest and stored grain. Um, so this first festival is in the midst of the harvest. And then again, when the festival happens in December, it's in connection with grain storage. Um, the shrine of Consus was underground. It was covered with earth all year and was only uncovered for the one day. Interestingly, Mars, the god of war, as a protector of the harvest, was also honored on this day, as were the lairs, the household gods that individual families held sacred. We've already talked about the lairs earlier this week. Um, Mars, yes, previously, uh, in, in, in last season, Mars was a... Um, agricultural god not just a war god um and we see mars tangled up in the romulus romulus and remus story in a lot of the ancient ancient roman uh harvest festivals and symbology all of that stuff very very interesting um okay let's move on to august 29th okay this day august 29th kicks off with <laughs> sorry <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with me sometimes. Uh, a disseminating moon in Gemini. Um, next week, uh, we'll kick off with the um, waning half moon in Gemini. That'll be our official moon that starts next week. But we are dealing with a disseminating moon in Gemini today, or August 29th. Um, this is a fantastic day for reading and comparing writings from different folks on the same subject, especially when they have differing views on the same subject. Book clubs, fantastic. Book discussions, fantastic. Any kind of intelligent research, fantastic. Also a great day for publishing stuff, if that's something that you do. Um, maybe there's something that you've just wanted to write and get off your chest. This is a great day to do that. It's great for poetry. It's great for writing of any kind, whether it's for yourself or it's something that you intend to share with other people or distribute to the masses. This is a fantastic day to get some of that work done. Um, for our lunar body, we are resting, restoring, relaxing, and soothing the shoulders, the armpits, the arms, the elbows, the wrists, and the hands. Um, very great day for that. And for our plant body work, we are harvesting, we are controlling pests, we are weeding and plowing. As I said before, plowing is not something that's very realistic for you and your four plants that you have in the window. Aerate the soil. Go grab a chopstick or, or something like that and just aerate the soil a little bit. Poke some holes in it, stir it up a little bit. Don't disturb the root ball of the plant but loosen up the soil a little bit, if it, especially if it's hard and crusty, because you want oxygen to be able to get down into the, down to the roots, down into the soil. Okay. Also on this day, um, we have Mercury entering Libra. So we have the moon entering Gemini, and then we have the planetary ruler of Gemini moving into Libra, an air sign. So we have a lot of air on this day. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about it for just a second. What is Mercury all about? Mercury is the planet that speaks to our processes of thinking, communicating with people, and things like commerce and teaching or learning, writing, speaking, the exchange of ideas, the exchange of opinions, all of that stuff. That's all Mercury's purview, learning things, teaching things, writing about stuff, all of that. All Mercury. And what is Libra all about? Well, you know, like all the signs, there's easy stuff and hard stuff about Libra. And so when we are moving through Libra season, we can be very easygoing, we can be very diplomatic, we can be very charming and artistic. 
but we can also be too focused on everything just being nice, whether people are actually getting what they need or not. Um, you know, going from diplomatic to just smoothing everything over. Uh, we might be very indecisive. We might be really vain and we might be really like overly delicate about ourself or our energy or whatever. So we have this, the roar fire over stimulation of Leo season <laughs> into the slight retreat hermitage moment. Let me get my act together of Virgo. And now we're gently and curiously and delicately stepping back out into Libra season of like, mm, I've got my finery on what's going on guys. Is the champagne cold enough for me to drink it? So Mercury is here. Our brain is here. And so our brain is definitely like, can we look cute while we do it? <laughs> can I, can I look at the paper that the invitations are going to be on and see if I approve, please? <laughs> it's a little bit of that energy coming into all of our lives. Um, Wherever you have Libra in your chart is where you're going to feel this energy for the next three weeks or so. Side note, Mercury will be going retrograde in Libra. You heard it here first, people. Okay, you've been warned. Figure it out. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out together. We'll talk about it. It'll be fine. Um, stuff happening on this day, not too much. One, other than our astrology, other than Mercury entering Libra, and that's huge. Mercury, I don't mean to downplay you. You're very important here. Um, but from our ancestors in Brittany, we have the day of Ahes. I don't have a lot of information about this deity. This was a magician and a princess of Brittany presented in several Breton legends. Um, what I did pick up is that they rode a horse across the ocean. They even gave birth on the ocean and they were left on an island by request. <laughs> like this whole human thing has been exceptionally wonderful, but I gotta go. <laughs> I was like, girl, I relate. I totally relate. <laughs> also on this day, and this is our last holiday for the week, and it is a very important one. This is uh, recognized by Orthodox Catholics as the day that St. John the Baptist was beheaded. And the traditional story around that is that uh, Herod had married his niece or something like that, King Herod. Uh, and John disapproved of that and said something about it. And Herod was like, off with his head. Um, more likely, King Herod was becoming more and more concerned about St. John's influence with the people, with the masses. Um, and he was like, oh, hell no. I already dealt with that Jesus fool. I'm not having another one come up in here and chopped his head off. But why bring it up at all? Because St. John is the counterpart to Christ or Jesus. And as we have talked about in the classes, St. John and Jesus are very close Catholic stand-ins for the Oak King and the Holly King. Jesus being the Oak King, John being the Holly King. And here we have the Holly King being beheaded. And how many times have we talked about in the Lunasod class, in the podcast, throughout Lunasod season, we see our male identifying deities, our kings, um, our mask presenting sovereigns or gods are all beheaded. They lose an eye. They are struck in the face. Um, maybe they are also emasculated. Um, sometimes they are killed. Sometimes they are just wounded. But also, there will always be a wound or a damaging mark or something like that to the neck, the face, the head, the eyes, the mouth, something something up here. <laughs> um, and so here, right in the midst of all of this, we have this symbol of St. John the Baptist being beheaded um, as the counterpart to Jesus, the Holy King. And so this is our crom dub. This is um, the dark bent one. Absolutely. Okay. That's the week. <laughs> I hope it's enough. <laughs> Let me see. Where are we at right now? How long is this podcast? Uh, like one, an hour 15. All right. I'm back on my shit. Okay. Let's go. <laughs> All right. Briefly to wrap up this week, our lunar phases are moving us from a full moon in Aquarius 
uh, into disseminating moons in Pisces, Aries, Taurus, and Gemini. For our astrology this week, we have the sun moving into Virgo. We have Venus in Libra trying Saturn retrograde in Aquarius at eight degrees on uh, Monday the 23rd. We have um, dun, 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 on Thursday the 26th, um, Mercury trine, uh, Mercury in Virgo trine Pluto retrograde in Capricorn at 24 degrees. And on Sunday the 29th, we have, or excuse me, Saturday the 28th, we have the Sun in Virgo square the North Node in Gemini at 6 degrees. And on Sunday the 29th, we have Mercury moving into Libra at 10.09 p.m. Pacific Standard Time later for everybody else on the planet. Um, our holy days this week, we do have a little bit of death work going on, a little bit of death and ancestor recognition happening there. Um, we have more and more and more mercurial energy seeping through, whether it's planets moving into Virgo or Mercury moving into another air sign. Um, or, you know, what have you, we have a lot of emphasis with that kind of energy, sorcerer energy, hermetic energy, and um, hermit energy, right? Shutting down and rolling in. Um, and in general, a lot of our holidays, though, this week, even with all of that stuff, are really geared towards this idea of queenship, sovereignty, and recognizing the holiness in the mundane, that's a lot of what's going on, which ultimately sits very, very nicely with our Lunasod work that we are doing. Because that's secret, secret side note here. That's really a lot of what we're doing with that whole um, I have power and I have maturity and responsibility to go along with it. Yeah, that's us recognizing the holy parts of our own nature Sorry, again, I don't make the rules. You're a holy being and you do really dope stuff and the gods are just waiting on you to get your shit together. That's all. No pressure. No pressure. The world is in a great state. Take all the time you need. <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay, I'm leaving you with one of my signature cackles. Uh, I hope you enjoy. I hope this full moon is good for you. Um... Don't let it rock you too hard, but let it rock you. Uh, it's good. It's good. All right, my dears. Love you so much. Blessed be. Bye for now. Hey, before I go, <laughs> um, let me also say this. I am offering a six-week tarot course. This is an introduction to tarot. It is called Welcome to Tarot. And we're going to do lots of stuff. But the idea of this workshop is for it to be a foundational introduction for you into the wide, wide world of tarot. Have you been dabbling with tarot and you want to get a little more serious? Have you just bought your first deck? Maybe you worked with tarot a while ago and have kind of just had it sitting on a bookshelf and you're like, maybe I want to get back into that. This is the course built for you. Uh, I'm not going to go into the whole ad, but come and take my tarot course with me. I'm really excited to offer this. Uh, a lot of the stuff I do is kind of at a 400 level, and this is definitely more of a 101. And um, the I and that's the idea. The idea is for it to be something that is approachable um, and that is intended to offer you tools, yes, to work with tarot in the now, but also something that can hopefully help you through your whole life with your magical practice in general. Um, we are going to do a, a cleansing and a blessing ritual for your deck uh, that I will teach you that you can use with any other deck that you buy for the rest of your life. Um, we will have homework. We will have quizzes. There will be worksheets. There will be toolkits. There will be lecturing. Surprise, it's me. There's going to be colorful slides, you know, all the stuff. Um, hit me up if you want to know more about it. The link is in the description for this episode uh, and you can read a ton about it. And if you are subscribed to my Patreon, you are subscribed to my Patreon, right? 
Okay, that's cool. But if you're not, you can. And if you are, you get a discount on my stuff. Uh, the various levels have various discounts, and those discounts work on this workshop from a dollar up. If you are subscribed at the $9 level, which is the Venus level, you get a 15% discount, um, which ain't half bad when you look at the prices. So, um, you know, come and check it out. Thanks. All right, that's it. Uh, oh, I guess I'll add this. If you would like to work with some tarot cards for this Aquarius new moon or full moon and for the astrology of this week, you could work with the star card that connects to the sign of Aquarius. But I really recommend working with um, the, uh, the Hermit card for Virgo. Um, I definitely recommend the strength card for Leo. And I think um, that working with the suit of pentacles is really fantastic for tapping into this energy that we're trying to foster here of like, not just being a badass, but being a badass here on the physical plane, producing the results here in the material world. And in particular, the seven, eight, and nine um, or even the eight, nine, and 10 of pentacles is really fantastic for doing this work. The empress card is very supportive here. The queen of pentacles card is also very supportive here. So these are all tarot cards that you can use as archetypes um, or magical symbols to meditate with. Just have them on your altar as representatives for deities and magical energies that you're working with, all of that good stuff. More of that in the workshop. <laughs> All right. That was the shill. That was the pitch. Mwah. Blessed be, guys.